So uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, thanks uh, for your attention. I'm Mark Josephson. I'm the uh, CEO of Bitly. Uh, I'm joined tonight by my good friend and uh, colleague Rob Platzer, who's our chief technology officer. Um, we are. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about our business, and Rob's going to talk about the, the infrastructure <coughs> and platforms that he builds and maintains and grows to support the business. Um, I am going to hit that slide. All right, so uh, how many people here have ever used Bitly? Okay, so the very first question I get asked, I've been at the company a year now, is I love Bitly, you guys are the best, I use you all the time, you, you're so big, you guys do all this great stuff, you must have all this great data. But like, what do you guys do, right? Like, what's your business? How do you guys make money? And what are you trying to accomplish? So this slide tells, we put a stake in the ground about uh, a year ago where we said, look, Bitly is a platform that is used by billions of people, um, it's, and I'll talk more about our stats, but our, our mission every day is, is when we wake up is to help marketers make better decisions by giving them insights into their data. And once that, that's, a, that's a really important thing for us to say because it focuses, focuses us on the platforms that we're building, the data that we're generating, and the insights that we mine to help our customers. And we have 45,000 brands that we work with directly on a free to paid spectrum, on a freemium model, to help help them increase the performance of their social and their marketing efforts and to give them deep insights into what's working and what's not. So um, at Bitly, we are focused on empowering marketers to make better decisions, the best decisions by providing insights. So everybody knows uh, that we shorten links, okay? We were the default link shortener on Twitter when Twitter started and we had that opportunity to build out uh, at that scale. Um, but what people don't know is that we weren't really interested in shortening, right? What we were really interested in doing was learning about how content traveled around the web and how people consumed um, all different sorts of uh, information. So uh, this is a fairly technical room, uh, but so we actually don't talk about shortening inside our company. We talk about encoding. All of our data is, in, all of our links are encoded and decoded. So we take a very long link that's very dumb, gets you from point A to point B. We wrap it in our code, we encode it, um, and it becomes something much more powerful. It becomes uh, a tag, it becomes a beacon, it becomes something that signals back to us every time something happens with that. So uh, th if you look at our original code, it's about encoding, uh, not about shortening. And so what that allows us to do is get very smart and learn a lot about, uh, collect a lot of data and learn a lot about how, the, uh, how, about how people use the web. So since 2008, we've gotten pretty big to the point where we're encoding or shortening uh, more than 600 million links each month. Those links are generating north of 8 billion clicks each month. Each click is a redirect through a Bitly server, so you can figure out what we're doing. Uh, with that opportunity, we see uh, in the last 28 days, we've, we've seen 1.8 billion uniques uh, across the world. About a third of those are in the US. Um, we see clicks in users from every single social platform, every single brand site, every single media site, and every single country in the world. Um, and we are laser focused on um, on learning as much as we can about those, uh, about those users and from those clicks and turning those into meaningful and actionable insights for our customers. Um, that's really hard to do uh, at the kind of scale that we have. And um, oh, I have one more slide before I do that transition. So one of the things that we, we've been doing, we just started this a couple of weeks ago, uh, is starting to just mine that user data, <laughs> mine that data to start to s tell some stories. So we actually were, um, we were looking at pre, uh, at Facebook and, tw and Twitter's uh, Pre-earnings, right? So before they announced their earnings for uh, Q3, we took a look at the at our global data set um, and started with uh, just the overall click volume because we because we have such a representative sample of all usage across all of their plat all of the platforms and uh, and globally, we wanted to see um, the big question actually coming into the uh, coming into earnings was uh, what is Twitter's um, active audience. Right? And is that growing? Because that was the number that they were pegging so much of their growth to. And we were able to show before they announced, actually, that we knew it was flat, right, globally. Um, we also saw mo uh, Facebook continuing to dominate and outgrow mobile, uh, the market in mobile. But then we took a look at our customers. So we get paid by uh, the best marketers in the world, Coca-Cola, Pepsi, um, Geico, GE, uh, Amazon, to help them uh, do better with their marketing efforts. And we took a look at the, at the subset of our customers who are marketers to see if Facebook, how Facebook was doing relative to Twitter and where they were gaining share. And so this is where you see Twitter actually having some good news in the quarter um, by increasing their, their performance uh, relative to other marketers in 
uh, relative uh, the platform and the marketers, but Facebook is just dominating. So Facebook uh, continues to show us interesting things. We, this is fairly high level uh, work on the data, but interesting because of the horizontal nature of our data set. So uh, it's really hard to do. It's really hard to build platforms that scale to at this kind of level to do that. And Rob's going to talk a little bit about um, how our data architecture supports our mission. <clears throat> Rob. Thank you, Mark. You bet. Uh, so I'm a little short for this podium, so if you guys see me hopping up and down so that I can get a better view of you guys. Uh, and I have to do a little, little more coordination than Mark. OK. <clears throat> so how does data architecture support our mission? Right. So our mission is to provide insights uh, into our connected world. And so we see, as Mark said, a billion clicks a month. Um, we see 1.8 billion cookies. That's a lot of data to process. So the architecture of our system is important for us to be able to solve these problems and solve them in different ways for all our different consumers and to provide different kinds of insights. So we have what's called a message-based architecture or a message-based system. So not entirely new for a distributed system concept, but it's critical for the work that we do. So what is a message-based system? That means that when a user interacts with our platform, we do the work that, that they asked for, but we collect all the metadata about that work, and we wrap that up into a message. So we take that event, and we turn that into a message. We put those messages on a queue. Then we can process that queue asynchronously, as fast or as slow as we want to. So the messages become the basis for a decoupled system, and they give us the flexibility we need for solving new problems. At Bitly, we've built our own real-time messaging queue. Uh, that's called NSQ. Some of you may have used it or actually will be working with it today. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about the specifics of that, but if you want to check it out, you can go to bit.ly slash NSQ, and you can read all about that. So <clears throat> messaging designs. So there's basically there's one primary problem we want to solve and four properties that give us the ability to solve that. So the problem I want to solve is I want to solve all our, all our independent data problems independently. I don't want to couple anything together. And so using messages gives us the fundamentals to grow in scale and reliability, but the flexibility in adapting to the new uses of the data, whether it's adding product features, new research, the hop for over here, um, or reporting or analytics. Oop, I'm not. I'm, yeah, I'm, sorry. So I'm one behind. Okay. So distribution. The first property I'm going to talk about is, be, is being able to handle distributed systems, right? So we want to solve capacity for each of the problems that we're trying to solve independently. So in this example, we have one queue, NSQ. So we've been building up messages on this, on this NSQ. Example events are users clicking on links, decodes, decoding links. And we might want to do different things with them. Here we're able to scale up workers, worker A, to solve a problem in a faster way or in a scalable way, different from the scale of worker B. So worker B may have a lighter weight problem, or we may care less about latency, but we're able to scale up quickly with worker A to solve that problem as fast as possible. So the messages that are intended for worker A are broken down into equal chunks for worker A, but every single message gets consumed by worker A's. OK, decoupling. So the second property we're interested in is decoupling. So as you saw in the past example, we actually have multiple kinds of workers here. We're able to take a single set of, of messages and multicast them. So multicast is a real-time messaging queue term. Multicast them out to multiple workers, making sure that every single message can be consumed by each worker. OK, so what's a practical example of this, right? So at Bitly, let's say our data science team wants to research the, the correlation between where a brand's audience is active and conversion rates for that brand. So we see links shared to a vast number of sites across the internet. We see billions of clicks on them. We see them shared out on every social network. There must be some interesting insights in there. How do we get the data to them? So here's, so here's a, a real world example where we have our, our messages going on our queue. We have our existing metrics and analytics system. We don't want to interrupt the flow of messages from there, from the, from the queue to our metric system. So we create new workers to process new data in real time. So we can create real time data and anal an analysis opportunities for our data scientists. And we create many of these different kinds that create different kinds of algorithms, different kinds of processing on the data, as well as archive it off to disk. So another key property of our messaging queue is persistence. So there's other queues out there that are persistent. Kafka, NSQ are examples of those. 
We persist the disk, and in our case, we persist everything to HDFS, which makes it nice and easy to do uh, offline analysis later. The third property that's very important for us is enrichment, data enrichment. So a common use case for us is to enrich our data as we go. So we need to do this through a processing pipeline. We can't just take our data, stop, and add all the bits of enrichment and annotations we need all at once. So what do we do? We, we, process, we take the messages off our queue, we process them, we put them on another queue, we process them again, put them on another queue, ad infinitum until we get to the point where we have all the data we need. So here's a simple example. Here's an abbreviated example of a raw decode. You have the basic bits here. You have the identifier for the short link. You have the long URL. You have the timestamp. And we want to add some data to it. So in this case, you've seen we've added two pieces of data. We've added the geo for the region. So this is a geo IP lookup, nice and straightforward and simple. Probably just needs one of those worker bees. Uh, and the second one, semantic analysis of the content at the destination. So we've added some topical keywords. News and sports probably took a little more time to process. We probably used a few more workers to get that done. But by going through this data processing pipeline, we can continually annotate and enrich our data as we go. We have lots of different use cases for annotation. We might annotate with third-party data. We might annotate with simple lookups. We might annotate with various things that our data science team has actually come up with to enrich the data for our consumers, for our marketers, for our analytics products, for people that are consuming our streams in real time. And the last property that is critical to us is integration. So queuing lets us do another thing, which is get the data out of our system in a very customizable way. So we've talked about the ability to process the data in a distributed way and to decouple our needs and to get the annotation and enrichment. Now we want to get that annotated and enriched data out to our customers. So we can pop up different queues very quickly that are annotated, that are correctly filtered, each one individual to the use case. And by using a consistent queuing methodology, we can build libraries in, that can be consumed in any language to get this data out. So examples are, we can provide a stream to any one of our Bitly brand source customers of their decodes only. So that is filtered and annotated as it passes through our system. We can provide a stream of data to an in-house DMP. That might be audience data. So what's, what does your audience look like on the users that are clicking to your links? We can, we can sync to third-party analytics tools. If you want to pull your data into Google Analytics or some other analytics tool via our streams, we can also connect to the marketing cloud. So any one of the, the thousands of point solutions or the enterprise marketing cloud solutions can pull in our data stream and integrate that data. So that's pretty much how it works. Um, in sum, right, there were four key properties for us that were critically important that message queuing solved. It was being able to distribute the work it's being able to um, enrich that data as we go. It's being able to separate concerns. And it's being able to distribute that data out to the consumers. OK, thanks. Cool, thank you very much for uh, allowing us to see how that works under the hood. Uh, I'm most curious how. Um, I mean, you mentioned like a GFS and a bunch of things. Like, presumably, when you guys started, that's not the architecture that you had because it was a very beginning of it, right? Correct. So, how do you how do you um, sort of keep on upgrading the engine as you as you go uh, for, for something like this? Yeah, I mean, it's a challenge, right? So we started out like many other companies do and many other technologies do, um, going for the straight and narrow. How do you solve the problem and solve it quickly? And then iterating over time. So there is a point in time, actually, where we changed our architecture completely over from a more traditional database model to a stream-based model. Um, and in fact, that causes us pain all the time. We won't try to go back and manipulate and manage links that were on the older system. So uh, we learned a lot of hard lessons. A lot of companies do. And we were lucky enough to be able to um, bring different technology to bear as quickly as we did. And did you find that you also needed to bring people that understood? I mean, or, or is that a, you know? such a, a new set of technology that everybody's right. sort of trying to learn at the same time. Yeah. Uh, well, the great thing about um, using this type of architecture is the, the application layer you put on top of it can constantly evolve, but the underlying structure of being stream-based has continued to work for us over the years, right? So every time we want to change the way something works, so an example is we want to swap out the underlying database that supports your link history or link management if you're an end user. We can do that because we've persisted all the messages to disk, we've got all the history, and we can replay all of that back into the new system. So it actually gives us a good, this has been constant for us, and on top of that, a great degree of flexibility. We can use the right tool for the right job. For any particular stream, you could say, I, have the, I need a different kind of data store to process this stuff. I want to get this stuff into how to perform MapReduce. I want to get it into React for this or that, right? So you can always build different things on top of it. 
Great. All right. Do we have questions? Hi, um, Catherine with MediaMath. Um, a lot of the C CDNs out there like Akamai, they've tried the monetization strategy that you mentioned, and I don't think they've had great success on there on that front. Um, I'm curious as to how are you activating the data that you're collecting differently than the people that have come before you guys? Sure. So, um, so we're primarily focused right now on helping people improve the performance of their uh, programs and giving them insights into how that's working. Uh, is it, when it comes to activation, you know, marketers are building uh, data sets and audiences that they own, and if we can empower them with their own data to do with things that they don't know about uh, otherwise, I think that's a competitive advantage. Um, we're not, uh, w we, we sit right next to the marketer. So we're helping them build an audience, we're helping them learn about that audience, and ultimately we help them activate against that audience as well in ways that they couldn't other places. So because of where we sit uh, next to the marketer and in the queue of, uh, of, of their, their programs across every platform, it's, it, we're, I think we're unique in that way. Good. Good. One in the back. Yeah, yeah hi. Uh, Shayak from Samsung Accelerator. Um, I had a question about your architecture. It's, there's a lot of similarities to the Twitter Storm architecture. Mm -hmm. Can you comment on some of the differences between the two? Uh, it is very similar. Uh, so Twitter, Twitter very specifically uses Storm to process all of the messages that come off of their queues. They do something very similar, real-time messaging and, proce and then processing. Um, most of our stuff is home-built aside from that. So we don't use Storm. We use, well, we have, we have what we call queue readers. And then we, we tweak, we have like a pattern for building a queue reader. And then we tweak those for our individual needs. And then we can spin up as many of those as we want to scale that. So it's, it's actually very similar for their real time. And then for the offline, we do the Hadoop processing. So we push everything. We persist all our messages into HDFS and keep them there for as long as is possible, just depending on capacity, space, and cost, um, so that the data science team can always go back and process that for different things. Hello, Ian. Um, if you uh, had to or wanted to redesign the internet to prevent you from doing the data mining that you do, uh, how would you go and do it? <laughs> uh, we wouldn't. Yeah, we wouldn't, right. Uh, yeah, the short answer is we wouldn't. Um, that's a great question. I have to give that some thought. Um, but I think that it would probably it would have something to do with redirects, right? 301 redirects and first party cookies. All right, great. Was the last one? Yeah, last time for last one. Shekhar Pradhan, NYU. So it was fascinating to, fascinating to hear you say that you invented Bitly not in order to encode or shorten links, but to find how data traveled around the net. So I was wondering, did you consider other possible ways of discovering that? Uh, so to be totally clear, neither Rob nor I invented Bitly. So we are, um, re we are relatively new in the history of the company. Um, and like many great businesses and companies, there's a very specific, simple need that exists that we were able to meet. So th we absolutely started to short make links shorter. So to be entirely clear, like that was, the world needed shorter links. 140 characters, the average link is 22 characters. You need to like shrink that link and make more space. And so we were there, we were at the right place at the right time. Um, but it's not the hardest problem to solve, right? It's, you know, like anyone here can go spin up a link shortener if they want. Um, pretty quickly, uh, but it's what, how do you use that moment to solve a bigger problem and, and learn something more? So that's what I meant by that. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you thank very you much. Thank you so much. There'll be a run for the drinking part after this. Yes. Wouldn't miss it. Thanks, Matt. Thanks.